Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 20th of August, 2013. This is a terrifically fun show. Uh, the Some of the authors of a book called Connected Learners from Anne Mikkelsen's class in Norway. Uh, with her are two of her students, Hakan Bakher and Ulrich Lee. And I'm going to let them say their names again if I've really demolished them. But welcome to each of you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank I'm, you. Going to, I'm going to turn my video on here and encourage uh, Hakan and Anne to turn yours on too. Ulrich, I don't think has video. But at least for a couple of minutes, you can see what they look like. You don't really need to see me, but that was to encourage them. And there you are. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. We have some really fun events coming up. Uh, this Friday and Saturday is the first ever homeschool, unschool, free school alternative education conference. Uh, it should be terrific. We have some. We have eight great keynote speakers, lots of practitioners. Very interesting conference. In September is our STEM XCon, a worldwide conference on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and more. That's what the X stands for. That's at stemxcon.com. These are free conferences. We encourage participation and presentation. You're going to love them. In September, I'm sorry, in October is our Library 2.013 conference third year of this virtual conference for librarians. And then in November, our we call it the mothership of the Global Education Conference, five days, 24 hours a day. It's just a blast. They all are. So hopefully you'll consider joining us for one of those. Coming up on the Future of Education next week, David Marshak talks to us about self-design. Students designing their own learning. That will come up in tonight's interview. Michelle Cordy on Hacking Your Classroom. Uh, in early September. Kevin Jones on his new project called Decogme. That might also come up in this uh, interview as well. But this is a fascinating project from Kevin about uh, not just students, but sort of the way in which the world has made us cogs and that's no longer true and, and how we deal with that. Doug Johnson is going to talk about the indispensable librarian. Then we have that great STEM XCon conference. Christine Gross Lowe on her book, Parenting Without Borders, looking at parenting practices around the world. Will Richardson on his book, Why School. Yovel Badash on No Child Held Back, his vision of using technology to reframe the conversation on education. Lenore Skenazy, she's the one who let her nine-year-old ride the subway in New York and got all kinds of heat for that. He was a subway nut, really excited about finally getting to, to take the subway. She let him do it and got a lot of negative backlash. So the question of how we treat our children, what kind of independence we give them. Brandon Bastide on a student bill of rights. Brandon is from the Gallup organization. That's going to be lots of fun. He saw my student bill of rights post and contacted me. And then in October, we have Connected Educator Month. The Reform Symposium, Connected Librarians, and Library 2.013. Anyway, lots of fun coming up. Hope you'll join us for one of those. All of our sessions are recorded in MP3 and full Blackboard Collaborate format. So uh, do look, Don Winkle and Michael Issa talk to us about student entrepreneurship, Franz Johansson on uh, the randomness of success. We talked to the folks of Black Mountain, the self-organized learning environment. Anyway, that's all up there. It's close to 400 shows, maybe even over at this point. OK, now's your chance to tell us where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. Look for the star icon. It's the second one down. You click on that twice, and then you click on the map. And feel free to shout out in the chat. Peggy George says she's in 108 degree heat in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm. Well, we've got Australia. We've obviously got Norway. The U.S., continental U.S., Alaska, somebody down there in the Pacific, wherever you are. So uh, Hakan, what time is it there in Norway? It's uh, 11 p.m. 
Well, thanks for coming on at 11 p.m. It's most appreciated. <laughs> no problem. Ulrich, what was the weather like today? Well, today it was, uh, I know, uh, late summer. Uh, a little bit cloudy, but nice weather. And it's being pointed out to me that New Zealand is not on this map. That's just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to rectify that. Peggy, send me your map, especially because having completely enjoyed a visit to New Zealand, I mean, absolutely having loved it, that's an oversight that I am quite embarrassed about. Okay, we're moving on. If, feel free to keep noting in the chat where you're participating from. People will enjoy hearing that from you. Okay, so we have a set of slides that Anne's prepared, but we're not going to go to them right away. However, Anne, Hakan, and Ulrich, at the, any moment of time, if you would like to have us go to the slides, please let me know. I'd like to do, I'd like to have uh, Hakan give us a quick overview of the project, after which I'll show that one short video. Um, Hakan, can I ask you to do that? Yes, sure. Uh, so, uh, Yes, where should I really start? You know, um, uh, Anne pitched the idea to us about writing a book in the, the winter of 2012, which was it's like eight or nine month, months ago. And uh, needless to say that some of the students were more into it than others. Uh, but, uh, Can I get you to talk just a little bit louder? Yes, of course. Perfect. Um, so some of the students were excited, more excited than others. Yeah, and uh, well, uh, after the winter holiday, we got together and we talked about how we can uh, how we could write a book that was directed to the teachers, but written from a student's uh, standpoint. Uh, and that's uh, basically what we did. And then we, for a few months, uh, uh, for the last semester, we wrote really much. And uh, now we uh, have a book, 2%. So y your class published the book. This is an English class, right? Yeah. So, Anne, you're an English teacher, right? That's true. That's correct. And, and did the idea come from you? Did you just one night wake up in the middle of the night and say, we should write a book? <laughs> no. Actually, a colleague of mine uh, suggested that we should write a book together but because we've been reading so much about the topic of technology in, in school. But that idea didn't turn out. And so I was walking around in my classroom and we were working just the way that I wanted to describe it to people. And I just suddenly thought, I should write this with my students. And then I asked Hokon if he thought that was a good idea. And he said, yes, I think it is. So we went ahead. Oh, Rick. What age are the students in that class, or were they that semester? Uh, can you repeat? I'm sorry. What, what grade level or age were you during that semester you wrote the book? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I guess most of us were like 16, 17. And is uh, this a certain level of English class? Yes, this is. Uh, this was the f uh, uh, it was the first year of English on high school, or the last the last year of mandatory English. So those uh, who speak another language uh, in the U.S. are going to be embarrassed at how uh, less than adequate our our language skills are compared to these students. Uh, I was really impressed and with the quality of the English. Is that fairly common for Norwegian students? Uh, yes, I, yes, I think so. Well, Rick, were you going yes, to answer? Yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, most Norwegians are actually quite good in English, and of course, we learn English from uh, from second grade. You know, we are like seven or eight years old when they start learning us English. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think the regions are uh, are quite good. Okay, I'm going to show this video that's kind of a, an introduction to the book, and then we'll come back and drill down a bit more. Here we go. If this doesn't start automatically for you, please click on the play button. If for some reason you can't see this video, I will put the link in the chat.
<laughs> if you, I hope it played through the end for most people. If not, please do watch the the video from the link. I love that last little bit. Uh, so, Hawkon, um everybody hopes their book will sell a lot of copies. Books usually don't. Um, how would, do you have a sense of is this book selling? Are you getting feedback from people? And even if it doesn't sell a ton, are you still happy you did it? Yeah, you know, we don't sell uh, millions upon millions of books, but uh, we sell to uh, teachers that are really interested in, are interested in what we did. And that's, um, I think that's more important than uh, the actual number of sales we got or have uh, right now. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we've gotten, I've gotten a lot of attention in Norway. Uh, especially from uh, we did an article with uh, uh, the largest uh, subscription paper here, and uh, that's really something that we are very proud of. I think you have a lot to be proud of, Ulrich. When I uh, finished the book, I thought I don't know if I would recommend other students to read the book, or if I would recommend them to write their own book. There was a lot of learning that probably took place in the writing of the book. Does that become kind of a model, do you think, for other students in classes? Well, I personally learned a lot from writing uh, writing the book. Uh, but of course, our goal with the book is to inspire teachers uh, to change the classroom. And Yes, it would be great if other classes also wrote books, but of course our goal is that they should uh, use more technology, use uh, use blogs and you know everything that we have uh, written about. And you write in the book, and, and your writing is kind of scattered throughout the book, that students creating their own education, the students should be creating their own education instead of having it be delivered. Uh, and, and you talk about the student-centered classroom. Um, you're an English teacher. Did it make it easier to do this because you weren't in a uh, another curricular area? Does the language, does the fact that it came through your language program, did it give you leeway you might not have had, say, in a history class or in another class? I I'm not sure about that because I'm I'm not familiar with the curriculum goals in all the different uh, subjects. But of course, English has some great curriculum goals that you can work on. Um, but I think a lot of the subjects in Norway are, are are the way that you can kind of tailor what you want to work with with your students, and then that you can you know ask questions, have the students asking the question and finding out things that they want to write about. So uh, I I think a lot more uh, teachers could do this, but certainly English is a great way to start. I've noticed the same thing here in the United States. The language immersion program schools here in the United States have a lot of latitude to bring in the kind of uh, highly uh, co-created uh, concepts that are harder in curricular areas where there is a set expectation sort of almost day by day of what will be taught. Um, Hakan, Hakan, do you know much about the American school system? And do you know enough to compare what your school experience is to an American student's? Uh, no, not really. But I think that most of uh, the things we learn uh, or the basics that we learn are the same, but maybe in the way that we are taught is uh, somewhat different. But I, I'm not sure. I have no experience in the American uh, school system. That's a hard question and maybe wasn't entirely a fair one. Okay, so uh, Ulrich, um, I don't know what you call your teachers there in Norway. I'm going to call her Anne. You'll have to excuse the informality. But Anne writes in one part of the book that digital literacy is less about tools and more about thinking. Did you find for yourself that was true? Well, yes, yes. I guess I, I guess I did. Uh, you know, all these tasks and all. Uh, and all the things you have done in English, it, it really makes me think. And, uh, 
And yes, I believe I, I'm not quite sure exactly what you meant. Could you just repeat? Well, so do you think that what you learned was uh, you obviously had to learn about the tools here, but do you think your core learning was the tools or was it learning how to learn? Oh, okay. Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, of course, I think learning how to learn was very important. Uh, I, I'm actually not quite sure what I, what I should answer because I think both things are correct, you know, uh, personally. Hard to uh, separate the two? Yeah, I, I, I guess, but of course, you know, I, yeah, I'm not sure if maybe Hope can, uh, can help me here. <laughs> well, and we'll let you help out since you wrote the phrase. Um, is digital literacy less about the tools and more about thinking? I, I actually think it is because I think uh, many many of the discussions in Norway are the core values versus technology, and then the people that are opposed to using technology in school often say that that's not real authentic learning, and then you have to read a book and you have to uh, memorize facts, and you can't just Google everything. They kind of have thinking that it's kind of a shallow way of learning, and that you're not going in depth. In your in your topics, so I think it's it's the tools help you learn stuff, but it's it's the learning that's important, and that's kind of the basic uh, basis for the book as well. Because we were we were working like this for half a year before we decided to to make the book, write the book, right? So we were just in the book describing the different methods we used for learning, and and we were using the blog and Skype talking to educators and, and, and people in other countries. And that's how we were learning from others. And of course, when you mention the differences between the American schools and Norwegian schools, we also had students in Alaska write some uh, post in the assessment chapter about different ways to be assessed. So we're kind of looking around for answers and then kind of collecting those in our book. It felt to me like the assessment piece is kind of the uh, sort of the last bridge, right? So in a student-directed or student-centered classroom, ultimately you'd think that that students should be learning to assess their own learning. But but assessment is traditionally seen in very formal ways. How did you did you were you able to combine both self-assessment and formal assessment, Anne? I think we were actually um, because you know um, formative assessment should go on throughout the year, and then uh, uh, formative assessment should go on throughout the year, and then you have the summative assessment at the end. So the blogging would typically be something that we would comment on each other's blogs, and I would obviously comment on that as well. And uh, and we we were discussing if we need needed midterm exams or not. And I, I tried to kind of go through the core values of the, of the students and see if I could find other ways to do things like that. So um, yes, I think we, we, we were certainly working on it a lot. And, um, and in the end, uh, I didn't have an exam for the students who had worked a lot on the book. They just kind of submitted some of their articles and we would, uh, we would grade that instead. OK, so let's kind of dig a little into the actual content. Hakan, what is web education? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a term that uh, we uh, uh, some of our the students uh, writing this book we came up with, and uh, I think that what we mean by web education is uh, uh, learn uh, on the web instead of education. It's uh, web education, and is that a different Ulrich, do you think, s significantly from the kind of education that your parents had? Well, personally, if if I if I understand Hokon correctly and my own opinion, uh, I find that education, uh, you, uh, using the internet in class, and using blogs, and uh, you know, uh, using more source sources is a lot better than the old traditional way. Uh, we all all use the uh, all uh, 
uh, we have all been, uh, you know, uh, been using the old way uh, before in school, and our high school is really the first time we have been using uh, revocation. And yes, I think it's a better way. I do. So uh, both of you are about to enter school this fall. Is that correct? When do, when does school start for you? Uh, we started last uh, Thursday. Okay. So you started last Thursday. This project was your last semester of last year, right? Yeah. So do you think that it will be different to go to classes that don't have a project like this? Well, uh, uh, both uh, Ulrich and uh, myself, we have uh, uh, chosen uh, uh, international English for uh, uh, what you call a choosing subject or what you call, in, call it in American, I don't know, but uh, we uh, are allowed to choose uh, three choice subjects and uh, we both have chosen international English and uh, uh, there we are going to work like we did uh, the first semester which uh, was working on the blogs that we uh, had. So but you're not uh, actually uh, leaving that pattern of learning? You'll still no. be webucated? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but the only problem is that it's only in our uh, English class and not really so much in our uh, other classes, which uh, uh, you know all the, the other teachers need uh, to take advantage of uh, what we have learned and what we think are the way that students learn the best. And would you tell us kind of how you? did this day to day. You set up stations for each chapter as I recall and can, can you kind of springboard from there and tell us how you organize this period of time? Yes, absolutely. You could, you know, you could show the slide where I have the timetable on because that's the way we organize our school in, in Norway. We, we have block, or my school, we have block scheduling. And um, that means that we have one subject each day. So just keep going, I'll, I'll say when, when we're there. So uh, last year I had English on Tuesdays. And um, I had English every Tuesday with this class from 8.30 until 1 o'clock. So we would, you know, every Tuesday for a couple of months we would be working on, uh, on this uh, book. And um, there you go, there it is. So um, you see the different color codes shows uh, the different kinds of subjects. So that's not my, my, my table, timetable, but that would be like a Tuesday that they have physical education in between that, but we didn't have that. So we had, you know, like five hours to work and we would just work on, we would just take the breaks when we needed it. And um, basically the book is that I have written, I have read a lot of books by uh, great educators and educator thinkers. Uh, great thinkers in this field, like Will Richardson, Cheryl Newsom Beach, Daniel Pink. I take all these different ideas and then I wrote a little about that. And then I had the students add their thoughts about these different topics that people are talking about because I believe that there's a lot of talk about the future of education, but there's not much talk with the students. So that's what kind of what I figured out that this was the first time the students had actually had the teacher ask them how they wanted to learn, what motivated them, how they wanted to use technology, and we discussed all these different topics that we mentioned in the book. So, and then it kind of just developed, and I saw the need for a chapter editor, and then I just asked, who wants to be editor of this one? And then, you know, everyone came on board. We They wanted to do different things, and uh, we would just, the chapter editors would come to school in the classroom first and sit down, and then all the students would come in and then they would just sit down where the topics were interesting for them and they could write about whatever they wanted to and then and we, we used OneNote and SkyDrive and everyone can see how the book filled up with material. So that was kind of an exciting way to, to work actually. So Ulrich, you were the chapter editor for gaming. So kind of how did that work? Well, uh, in that particular chapter I wrote by myself. Uh, since I was, well, really it was, I, I don't actually remember if it was Anne who suggested it or if I suggested 
to write about it. But uh, writing it was like it was to me extremely exciting and uh, and interesting. Uh, gaming is a subject that I that I am interested in, and using it to learn is something that I think has great potential. Um, of course, uh, writing it was how do I say it? it was it was hard, but since it was so interesting, it was extremely funny. Uh, again, it was funny, but uh, how do I say? exciting. And uh, well, yeah, it was. I'm not quite sure if you meant like how I did it or like. Well, it sounds like you way. you were sort of solo there. Um, yeah. Did you reach out to people in the international community to get some feedback or advice on what you would focus on? Well, I uh, read a lot, uh, a lot of uh, texts that other people had uh, written, and I did a lot of background checks. checks and uh, well, I, I did not exactly talk with other people. Uh, I did my own research and uh, I played all of the games that are listed I have played and, uh, and judged. And uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, so it's, it's based on my opinion, but with the help of other, uh, of other uh, people in the community, yes. Uh, so tell us the problem with trace effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I, uh, I am, uh, how would I say that? I'm a professional gamer, uh, sort of. I, uh, I game a lot. Um, well, trace effect was, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but it was just not really interesting. Uh, it was not enough to learn English, it was uh, laggy. Uh, it, uh, of course, it, it was a great idea, uh, and it, it is absolutely great that the Department of Education in the U.S. Uh, as you know, got the idea and, uh, and made it. But it just it didn't catch interest, and uh, I'm not quite sure what you were supposed to learn either. So that was a case of a game specifically written for the teaching of English. And and in your opinion, you felt like it just didn't come up to the level or match your expectations of how uh, gaming can actually help learning? Yeah, that is, that is correct. Uh, I have, in the book, I have focused mostly on uh, learning social science, uh, history, politics, uh, and that sort of things. Uh, and when it comes to language learning, of course, games can be of great help, but it's I, I didn't feel the game gave me any gave me any satisfaction in learning. It was uh, it was more frustrating, you know. Okay, good. So Hakan, you uh, were one of the uh, project leaders for the project as a whole, but you were also a chapter editor for the chapter on assessment, right? Yeah, that's right. Did you have other contributors in that chapter? Yeah, uh, we uh, uh, had uh, uh, we had a lot of contribu you know, contributors uh, all over the book, but uh, especially in assessment because that's a really important uh, it's a really important uh, <laughs> Part of our uh, students' uh, school uh, uh, school uh, time and learning, uh, but we talked to several other people about uh, what they thought about the assessment and uh, sort of uh, dotted down our own uh, our own uh, thoughts and ideas and uh, what we came uh, finalized was. Uh, Maybe an idea that people need to think differently about the way they assess their own students. So tell me, tell us, kind of how it worked to organize a group of student writers working together on a chapter. Well, as uh, Anne mentioned earlier, uh, where the chapter editors would uh, 
uh, going to class and sit down at the table and uh, other people would, would uh, or our other students and writers would uh, come and sit down uh, at the table that they thought was, was uh, interesting. And uh, uh, it was like if you didn't have anyone to or didn't have anything to do, you would uh, go and ask the chapter editors if they needed some help with anything or they had an article ID. Uh, and if the uh, chapter editors needed something done, they could uh, always go and find someone who was <laughs> looking for a job. So, what did you ever get disagreements? How did how did people resolve different ideas? Well, we have gotten that question a lot. If there was a lot of conflicts uh, during the making of the book, but uh, it was not. It was really, really peaceful. Uh, uh, and uh, no, every everyone was uh, collaborating on the same project, and it was uh, no really big disagreements. But we had a, a funny story. We had a uh, me and a friend of mine uh, was writing about uh, the different tablets and phones that the teachers uh, should use, and. Uh, there we uh, always have a big discussion about the uh, iPad versus uh, an Android tablet. So I think that was the biggest uh, argument that we had during the making of the book. And there's a fair amount of discussion in the book, Anne, about how the technology impacts the collaboration. Right? I mean, you tried different tools and you found that, uh, like for instance, it's mentioned that you didn't use Google Docs because there was too much refreshing and updating. What kinds of things became apparent to you about the tools that worked well for this kind of collaborating? Well, in the beginning, we, uh, before we started writing the book, I introduced a lot of ways that the students could work together. So the Google Doc, actually, I had a lecture, and then I had divided the class in three. One group could take notes with the pen and paper. One could take notes on the computer. And then one could take notes on this Google Doc that they shared. And what happened was that if 13, 14 are sharing the Google Doc and writing at the same time, it gets confusing. So we kind of dismissed that at once. But Google Docs is great for sharing, you know, asynchronous uh, uh, sharing that you we did with the students in Alaska, for instance, or, or in Nebraska, we would write in the same document. But OneNote and SkyDrive turned out to be a very good way for us to collaborate because then we could see, you know, it, it shows you who the authors are and you can all, always see who has uh, written something there. So, and then you can work in OneNote offline and then when you're online it, it synchronizes. So it's a good way that everyone is writing. And then in this project, you just have to trust people that everyone is doing their best and not deleting other students' stuff. So everyone had full access to the document at all times. Well, Rick, aside from the obviously brilliant chapter on gaming, what other parts of the <laughs> book have you, do you feel like now, oh, I'm really glad that somebody worked on that because I now know more than I did before? Well, I have to say uh, that the part that I'm most happy about being in the book is uh, is assessment, which uh, Håkon uh, wrote, uh, because I think it's a really important subject, and it's a subject that needs to be more thought about uh, in especially the Department of Education. Uh, I think there is uh, way too much uh, too much focus on tests and uh, characters and uh, not, I mean I grade them. I mean sorry uh, and uh, and well yeah I I think that's a very important subject uh, which which I also learned a lot from uh, from reading you know it uh, it made me think. Talk on what about you aside from the obviously brilliant chapter on assessment. What do, what are you really glad came up that you're going to take with you? I think it's uh, student engagement and motiva motivation. Uh, we wrote about that throughout the book, and uh, I re I really think that we uh, 
discovered many ways that teachers could engage their students and uh, I think that uh, uh, those ideas should be uh, brought forward and used. So I'm going to use that to springboard to a hard question for you, Anne. Uh, how many other teachers at the school watched what you did and are now going to do the same thing? I would say that there are always some that, that are really eager and, and supportive. So people are now signing up for one note workshops. I could see that. So you always need someone to go in front and then others will slowly pick it up. So at our school, I think a lot of us teachers will do that in some way or the other. And, and I, I'm hoping that more teachers collaborate within the classroom and then with other classes in, in, the, in their school and then start from there. So the, the, I mean, this is an interesting conversation, right? Because it may be that, that nobody else sort of jumps in fully the way that you did. And what I'm hearing from the two students is that the, both the assessment and the engagement pieces here were really significant for them. They've signed up for being in the next class where you'll be doing that again. And they wish that other classes would do it. Um, can, can schools change rapidly enough to address the needs of these motivated, engaged students? And what, what would have to happen for schools to change that fast? Well, obviously, they would have to read our book, Steve, and then uh, get some ideas. <laughs> because I just have to say that, though, because one of my points is that there's not going to be a bottom-up revolution or not a top-down revolution. There's going to have to be a revolution of, of students and teachers learning together. And we need to just kind of pass the the notion that all students are digital natives and then all teachers are not because I think this was an adventure we did together. I think I changed their views during that year. I don't think they really knew what they could expect and how they could use technology to learn. You can certainly ask them about that. I think it has to change with both the teacher and the students at the same time. And then, of course, you need the school leaders to encourage this kind of work in the classroom. So but you do mention in the book uh, Sir Ken Robinson's talk about schools killing creativity. Um, I, I think this is a dilemma. I mean, I think that, that these, that as much as we want to believe these two kind of ways of viewing school can coexist, I'm concerned that there, that there is a dilemma here that's harder to resolve. But well, let's move on from that. Um, Ulrich, oh, one of the things that doesn't get mentioned in the book, or at least I didn't see it, maybe it was, is this idea of students becoming curators of a specific area of knowledge, right? That, that you're learning to be a person who has a depth of understanding in a specific area could lead to kind of a way of thinking about your life and your career. And, and maybe that's just implicit in the book, but it, in one quote, a student was asked, you know, how will this change your life or your job in the future? And the answer was, I don't think it will. Do you think that this will change who you are long term? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, um, you mean if the project will change? Yes. Will yeah, you be, okay, yeah. Do you think it will change how you approach school, how you approach work? Well, of course, I will work uh, towards, uh, in what way I can, uh, a school with less assessments, uh, more focus on learning. Uh, and that is something I have learned from this project. Uh, and uh, I my my view on school has really changed, and my view on how school can be uh, instead of the old traditional way. Uh, so yes, it it has changed my opinion on school, uh, and it has changed uh, 
change my focus, uh, I would say, from uh, from uh, grades to learning. Hakan, what about you? Well, I think that uh, uh, the book has changed the way I, I really look at uh, uh, my work uh, at the school and what I can do about my myself to motivate myself to work more. Uh, and I've really taken advantage of a lot of the tools available online, both free and some of them are paid. And uh, I try to integrate them into my workflow so I get, can get more enjoyment out of uh, working at the, uh, my school. But, uh, you know, uh, when we wrote the book, uh, the tools that we used were really, really good. And uh, that's just something I want to bring forward and use uh, more. And I think this is a very interesting topic for me because I find that increasingly as more and more people involved in education are using the web proactively, that we're seeing more and more of the value and importance of becoming the curator or someone who thinks deeply about a particular aspect of education. Do you think that's an accurate way of kind of describing the world that these students are going to move into? Yes, actually, it was fun that you mentioned the topic curator because we actually wrote about that in the book, and then I stumbled upon Sylvia Rosenthal Corisamo's webpage where she writes about students as curators, and I actually asked her if I could, could use some of her material, and she, she said, I would love to help you, and if you want to Skype with me, you can. So some of our students got to Skype with her, and that's when I think they mentioned that in the book, that that's when they thought that this might be a viable subject, uh, subject uh, to write a book because she was so interested in it. And I think, you know, I, I talk about filter bubbles and uh, how to filter out the information that's out there. I think that's going to be a very valuable thing for students to be able to, to know people that they can trust and who filter out the, the kind of information that they need to move on with their subjects and, and in, in their work and, and later on. So I think that's very important for, for students to learn school. Well, Rick, what was the best advice you felt that for you from one of these outside experts from your personal learning network that you got as you went, as you participated in these interviews of people from around the world, who, who did you really appreciate? Well, that's a really difficult question, uh, actually. Um, I I really felt that all of the interviews were helpful, uh, and it was really interesting to uh, to hear what, uh, you know, teachers and others uh, said. Uh, I was not uh, that was the own chapter in the book, uh, so I did not. Uh, most of these interviews, I did not take part in. Part in myself, I only read the, uh, read them later. Um, but of course, I, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how, what I should say. Actually, uh, it's it was a lot of useful advice, uh, uh, but of course, I did disagree with a lot of them as well. Uh, you did. Yeah, some people were. Of course, there are always some people who are uh, who are uh, not positive and uh, negative uh, to uh, to these projects, and you know, who are stuck in the old uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, way. So, Interesting. Uh, I'm yeah, not going uh, to. I'm not going to ask you to name any names. So, <laughs> hawk on. Who, was there somebody that, that was interviewed that you really liked or you felt like made a big difference for you to hear them? Uh, no, but I, I uh, oh, well, there was uh, a lot of people that we interviewed that was, uh, uh, that was uh, great that we did the interview on them. But I really uh, enjoyed, the, uh, the, let's say, some of our students went to our local community and asked uh, around with other with other people around in our community, and they uh, 
had their ideas and they had the, their opinions about what we did. And the, most of them were were a great feedback and uh, what we could do better and what was uh, great about the book. And uh, that's uh, maybe not an advice, but it was uh, something that we really appreciated when working on the book. You know, I'm going to take away from this interview this idea of the, that was in the chat of students writing textbooks. I think this is a really significant idea. And as much as I loved the outcome, the output that uh, the, the you students produced, the process is the one that that really intrigues me. This this process of becoming a, an expert in a specific area and working together on that chapter, and and then kind of leaving with that understanding of the value of that sort of deeper dive. Um, I have to finish the interview a few minutes early because I have a training session that follows immediately. So let's quickly go to Q and A and see if anybody in the audience has any questions, and then give you each a chance to kind of wrap up with any sort of final thoughts ab about the project. So um, if you have a question for Anne or Hakon or Ulrich, please feel free to put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand to the third icon over in the participant box, and we'll let you ask a question. While we're waiting for that, we're going to finish with the students here, Anne. So from your perspective, any kind of final words about why this was valuable or words of encouragement to others? Uh, who was that question? Welcome. That's for you. For me? Yes, Anne, for you. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, one of the most positive things that I take away from that project is I really got to know my students. I don't think I ever know students as well as I have this year. And, and just to give me, uh, trusting them to do the work and then they come through and they really do it. And I know a lot of these students would not have done a lot in English uh, this year with an ordinary textbook and just answering questions. And they, they said as much to me. And I could see how they changed throughout the year. And so that was just an amazing thing for me. And then my experiment was, can you find a project that will motivate 27 students? Because that's what I hear at conferences all the time. You know, how to make students innovative and creative, and you should do this and this. And they always have these examples. But I've never seen them have examples of the whole class working like this. I, was, I wanted to try that out. And that was a positive experience for me. What a lovely wrap up. Uh, Peggy wants to know, Hawkon, and you said good question, uh, whether you'd consider writing another book collaboratively on your own outside of your assigned schoolwork. You say maybe not, but it might be fun. If you were going to write a book, what would it be about? Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, I think what I would really like to write about is different tools and get really deep into the different tools that teachers can use and students can use in order to get a better learning experience. And uh, personally, I've been trying to figure out the best way to learn uh, using the, you know, the digital tools for quite a while now and sometimes it's still not perfect but I think I've come the, a very long way. I love it. We're getting lots of good questions. Ulrich, you have your choice. You can either tell us what book you would write on your own or you can tell us what advice you would give other students who would want to have the same kind of experience you had. Well, I, I think I'll answer uh, the student's uh, question. Um, I think that if students are sitting in a classroom and the teacher is uh, is using the old ways and uh, and the students really want to uh, to do as we did, uh, I think the most important thing really is to try to ask the teacher, uh, make the teacher buy a book, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's like it's all about making the teach teacher uh, take action. You know, uh, yeah. Okay, that's terrific. 
Um, I think we're going to have to stop there. I'm really sorry to do so, but I uh, have another commitment at the top of the hour. I have to prepare for Hakan, Ulrich, and thank you so much. This was really interesting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as uh, I did. Uh, we thank sure you. did. Yeah, thank you. thank you for having us. Yes, and I'm going to tease you. So in the United States this year, the Department of Education is doing another Connected Educator Month. I don't know, Anne, if you were aware of this from last year, but I've talked them into letting me do Connected Learners events as part of Connected Educator Month. So I'd like to I'd like to reach out to your students, so if you would let me know if you feel good about that, let's think about some other things that we could potentially do. And I think it would be really fun to organize some kind of an event around digital literacy. We didn't talk about that aspect of the book, but I think it would be neat as well. So uh, Hakan, Ulrich, and any of you can respond, or any of your students, if that's something that would be fun to do. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm going to put up our last slide here, which is the upcoming interviews. David Marshak on self-design next week, then Michelle Cordy on hacking your classroom, and much, much more. Thanks. Those in Norway, those elsewhere, that was a lot of fun. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye. Turn the recording off. Great job.